Our democracy uh, is uh, threatened now, for sure. Uh, and there's a new number one threat, and that is misinformation and disinformation. And I think that's intimately connected to the threat we now face in American democracy. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World, I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I am coming to you direct from Davos, Switzerland. For 54 years now, this Alpine village has been home to the World Economic Forum. It's a gathering of some of the world's most powerful people, heads of state, CEOs, deep-pocketed investors, but even they don't seem much of a match for the level of crisis the world is facing. While main stage conversations all week focused on artificial intelligence, conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East and climate change, behind the scenes, most of what I heard involved deep concerns about the US election and the state of American democracy. So I sat down with a man who knows a thing or two about that, former Vice President Al Gore. But first, do you live in a red state or a blue state? Until fairly recently, such a question would have made no sense at all. Let's roll back the clock. The time has come. You've seen the map. We've looked at the figures, and NBC News now makes its projection for the presidency. Reagan is our projected winner. On November 4th, 1980, NBC News became the first major network to call the presidential election for Ronald Reagan. And what stands out to me about this clip is not the absolute drubbing that President Carter received, but instead those colors on that map. States that had gone for Reagan are blue. States yet to be decided are that weird 1980s yellow and lonely little Georgia, which native son Jimmy Carter had managed to hold on to as red. It wasn't, in fact, until the contested 2000 election between then Vice President Al Gore and Texas Governor George W. Bush that major news networks agreed on a standard red state Republican, blue state Democrat map scheme. That's right, one of the most iconic signifiers of Republican or Democrat identity, second only to the elephant and the donkey, is a modern invention and one born out of confusion. Let me refresh your memory. On election night, news networks flip-flop between calling Florida for Bush or for Gore, Gore or for Bush, when the final election returns showed Bush leading the state by 536 votes, that's out of six million. Gore demanded a recount, suspecting that votes in Democratic strongholds had been miscounted. And no, I will not be explaining what a hanging chat is. Republican lawyers then sued. They argued the narrow recount ignored votes in other counties, and the case went to the Supreme Court. And in a politicized, highly controversial 5-4 ruling, the court sided with the Republican argument and ordered an end to the recount, handing Bush the election. Now, by that point, news networks had committed to one red state, blue state map because otherwise we'd all have gone crazy. And here's another sign just how different things were in 2000. At this point, Al Gore could have tried to discredit the court's decision as politically motivated. Heck, he could have urged his supporters to convene on the Capitol to demonstrate their outrage. Instead, Gore conceded. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. What a difference 24 years make. Not only is our country firmly divided into red states and blue states, but election results are now in the eye of the beholder. Now, to her credit, Hillary Clinton did concede to President Trump very quickly in 2016. But Democrats also spent most of Trump's presidency trying to prove that he was a Russian asset. Hashtag, not my president. And today, more than a third of all Americans believe that Biden's victory in 2020 was illegitimate, despite audits in multiple states and dozens of court rulings proving the opposite. In fact, the number of Americans who doubt the results has actually grown in past years. Al Gore's legacy will forever be tied to his fateful decision to put the peaceful transfer of power over his personal ambitions. He was also acknowledging the shared reality, as unpalatable as it might have been for himself, where George W. Bush would be the next president of red and blue states alike. Hmm, if only there was another way to express the concept of an unpalatable reality. Our ability to live is what is at stake. Because if Al Gore is famous for something other than losing an election, it's alerting the world to the dangers of climate change long before it was cool to do so. 
When An Inconvenient Truth came out in 2006, only two in five Americans thought humans played a role in global warming. Fewer still thought it was a serious issue. Today, that number is closer to three in four Americans. While it might be feasible to deny the results of an election, it's another thing to deny that your Florida beach home is underwater. See, it all comes back to Florida in the end. So let's talk to the man who makes us confront reality even when we really don't want to. Here's my conversation with former Vice President Al Gore. Vice President Al Gore, thanks so much for joining us on GZR. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to talk to you, of course, about global climate, uh, which is such an important, uh, critical part of the agenda here. But before I do, uh, mm. go back to home for U.S. democracy. Yeah. 2000 elections were incredibly divisive, determined yeah. by a partisan vote of the Supreme Court, political vote. Um, but nonetheless, we had a free, peaceful transfer of power. We did not have that in 2020. Mm. And it looks increasingly yeah. like we're not necessarily going to in 2024. What happened? <laughs> well, uh, we we had a candidate uh, who refused to accept the verdict of the American people. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, and the alleged crimes that he committed may be adjudicated in court uh, if, as many expect, the U.S. Supreme Court rejects his claim of total immunity that he's able to, he would be able to assassinate his political opponents with impunity and total immunity, which is of course completely absurd. His lawyers tried to skirt that, I saw, yeah. It's, uh... Well, yeah, uh, but you know, the, the lawyers were put in a tough spot by their clients' uh, desires there. But in any case, uh, our democracy uh, is uh, threatened now, for sure. Uh, and. You know, here at uh, Davos, uh, every year they compile this uh, list of the greatest uh, threats, much as you do, of course. And uh, on the Davos list this year, there's a new number one threat, and that is misinformation and disinformation. And I think that's intimately connected to the threat we now face uh, in our in American democracy. Uh, these uh, algorithms that uh, suck people down uh, proverbial rabbit holes. They're more like the pitcher plants with slippery sides. And at the bottom of the rabbit hole, that's where the echo chamber is. And people who dwell long enough in the echo chamber become vulnerable to a new kind of AI, not artificial intelligence, artificial insanity. Uh, and it is weaponized by those who are inculcating the delusions. And you get QAnon and climate denial and uh, election deniers, and uh, that is a, a very serious threat uh, to our ability to, to govern ourselves. You know, um, knowledge freely available to free people is the basis on which we can engage in democratic discourse and challenge one another's views and reason together and come to a shared conclusion as to what is more likely than not to be true and then use that as the basis of decisions. But the undermining uh, of the law, uh, journalism, uh, when we have probably the best generation of journalists overall in human history, it's really quite remarkable, I think, um, uh, and the refusal to accept the fair elect uh, results of elections that have that have been studied very carefully with that and found not to have any uh, significant plenty of judicial cases correct uh, all thrown out exactly correct that is um, that undermines the authority of knowledge and uh, and puts wind in the sails of this authoritarian populist wave that is now uh, a global wave and there are many other causes for it but but uh, the misinformation and disinformation goes hand in hand with the, the dictator wannabes uh, who want to overturn the authority of knowledge and uh, put their will uh, in the, the driver's seat. If we don't have facts, it's hard to have democracy. Correct. So, uh, Mr. Vice President, if you don't mind, let's turn to an issue that's been very close to your heart for mm. a very long time. I, mean, I come here to the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. and I see you know, hundreds of billions of dollars being invested in transition energies. I see renewable energies cheaper today than fossil fuels in many places around the world. It feels mm. like we have come a very long way. Mm. I want to see a future mm. of decentralized, inexpensive, abundant, sustainable energy. 
Do you see that future? Are we on path for that future? We're not on that path, uh, at least not the way we should be. We have seen significant progress. There's no question about it. And there is a lot of good news. Uh, cost of solar declined again year on year in 2023, 50, another 50%. It, it's really quite remarkable. It's now the cheapest electricity yeah. in the history of the world. Wind is not uh, far behind. And if you look at the newly installed electricity generation capacity around the world, 80% of it's now annually uh, solar and wind. However, the installed base of fossil uh, fuel energy is so large and the overall energy consumption continues to grow with population and with new uh, energy hungry technologies like artificial intelligence, for example, uh, we, we are seeing a continuing rise in the emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. And th this, is the, th this is the heart of the, the problem, Ian. Uh, the climate crisis is a fossil fuel crisis. Today, we will put another 162 million tons of man-made heat trapping pollution into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planet. That thin blue line you sometimes see in the pictures from space mm -hmm. is blue because that's where the oxygen is. And it's thin enough that if you could drive a car at interstate highway speed straight up in the air, you get to the top of that blue line in about five to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. You could walk it in an hour. And when you get to the top of that blue line, all of the greenhouse gas pollution is below you. And it lingers there. On average, each molecule stays about 100 years. And so it builds up, and it's been building up. And the total amount there now traps as much extra heat in the Earth's system as would be released by 750,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding on the Earth's surface every day. That's a ridiculously huge amount of energy. And that's what's heating up the oceans and disrupting the water cycle and melting the ice and creating the giant rain bomb downpours and the floods and mudslides. We are in danger of crossing some negative tipping points that could unspool the stability of the system, the climate system that has given rise to the flourishing of humanity. I'll give you two examples. The Gulf Stream, which is part of a larger ocean current system linked all around the world. The leading scientists say that has now slowed by 30%. If it flipped, if it stopped, which some scientists are seriously concerned mm -hmm. about, because that did uh, happen in the ancient mm -hmm. 12, 14,000 years ago without going into those details. Uh, Europe went back into an ice age for another thousand years. Uh, the consequences of disrupting that ocean current system would be incalculable. So we're experimenting in real time on humanity's future. Correct. Uh, at the end of the last ice age, we settled into this stable climate pattern, which led to the agricultural revolution, the building of the first cities, and the emergence of the civilization we enjoy now, all of which has been uh, conditioned upon the set of, con uh, of climate and environmental parameters that we have adapted to. We're in danger of radically changing those. And we are also in danger of triggering a runaway phenomena because one third of the land mass in the Northern hemisphere is made up of frozen soils embedded in which are massive amounts of dead plants and dead animals. If that is allowed to thaw, it releases that both yeah. CO2 and methane mm -hmm. and could create a feedback loop. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. I was waiting for it. If, <laughs> if we get to true net zero yeah. and stop incrementally adding to the amount of heat trapping gas that's there, the temperatures will stop going up almost immediately with a lag of as little as three to five years. Now, that's new science. It's well confirmed now. It, they used to believe that it would keep going even after we reach net zero, but no, it will not. And the even better news is that if we stay at true net zero, then half of all the human caused CO2 uh, and methane will fall out of the atmosphere in as little as a quarter of a century. Really? 25 to 30 years, yes. And the long healing process will begin. But that, the, but there's a big if in that sentence. 
You have to hit it. We have to hit it. You have to hit it. Now, the good news, again, continues in that we have the technologies we need to, to, to reach true net zero and stay there. And the even better news is they're cheaper uh, sources of electricity. They don't have the co-pollution, the particulate pollution that kills almost 9 million people a year, every year from the lungs. That's why China emissions. started moving is because they, they had a problem with air pollution. Correct, and yeah. India is now not far they're facing behind. It. Yeah. Last year, 93% of all the new electricity generation in India was solar and wind, which is a remarkable a achievement. Part because India and Pakistan have some of the worst air conditions in the world, in their cities. Of, of course. People can't live. And there are a range of other technologies and, and batteries, electric vehicles, 20% of all the new cars this year worldwide were EVs. 50% of all the new two-wheeled yeah. vehicles. Yeah, China dominated that yeah. statistic, but yeah. it's spreading worldwide. Yep. Uh, and 50% of the two-wheelers are new ones are electric. India too? Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's it's coming on very rapidly. Uh, and that that's part of the good news. But we face a major obs two major obstacles in really getting on the path that we need to be on. First of all, access to capital for the installation of green technologies is not available in the developing world. Right. India is an outlier. Right. And the foreign exchange risk, corruption risk, rule of law risk, and other risks in developing economies make it almost impossible to get the private capital that's needed. All that uh, new solar and wind, 86% of the money came from the private sector. Okay, sure. But with the home bias, uh, the, that capital stays mostly in the places it originated, and the developing economies are, are kind of walled off from it. The second obstacle, and this is really important and connected to the democracy narrative that we got into at the beginning, yep. the fossil fuel industry and the petrostates uh, have been engaged in a massive campaign to block the progress that would phase out fossil fuels. Uh, of course, some of the large uh, fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil, for example, have engaged in massive dishonest fraud for decades. And it's all documented uh, very, very thoroughly. Uh, I mean, they took the blueprint from the tobacco industry when the Surgeon General's report alerted us to the dangers from smoking cigarettes, they hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them on camera uh, to say, hi, I'm a doctor and there's no health problem at all and, uh, involved with cigarettes. Uh, and 100 million people died uh, as they conducted that campaign worldwide. Well, they're doing essentially the same thing on fossil fuels. In fact, the American Petroleum Institute just announced a brand new $100 million advertising campaign last week designed to convince the American people that a transition away from fossil fuels is impossible and must be slowed down if not stopped altogether. So what I'm hearing that's is pure greed. <laughs> fundamental challenge to American democracy and to humanity's future disinformation. Yeah, a a absolutely. You know, and, and it's uh, it, it runs very deeply because the vast majority of the American people want to ban assault weapons. But the Congress is pathetically unable to do it because of misinformation and disinformation and, and the astroturf false grassroots movement scaring the hell out, out of elected officials so they won't vote uh, the way the American people want them to. The vast majority of the American people want to see bold action on climate. And we finally got the IRA, but where we ought to have a, a carbon tax. I mean, you know, a carbon tax and a two-state solution in the Middle East have one thing in common. We've known for decades that's, that's what the you most need. important yeah, solution. Happen, yeah. But the political figures yeah. have given up on pushing it. We also need. I think we'll get there faster than we will a two state solution, by the way. Well, uh, I hope we get to both of them. And I don't I, I claim expertise on the ongoing negotiations in the Middle East, but I think that we may be reaching a, a point where big changes are, are becoming obviously necessary. Uh, I, you know, Rudy Dornbush was a friend of mine in the last century, and he, he uh, had Dornbush's law uh, stated simply. He said, things take longer to happen than you think they will, but then they happen faster than you thought they could. I think we're on the cusp of getting to where we need to be on climate, and I dearly hope that we will 
make progress on uh, Israel, Gaza, on Ukraine, uh, and on the other challenges that exist and alongside the on our crisis. democracy. Vice President Al Gore, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see here, even if you don't, but you just want us out of Davos, we can't stay here that long. Take a minute to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily.